Thank you so much. Not sure if it's wisdom, but I will share a little bit about what, what I know and what we do. And I'm extremely happy to be here. I love this meeting, and I love that we have people from um, the patient advocate societies. We have patients. We have um, bench scientists, um, clinical scientists, um, people from industry, and people from around the world in all of these um, aspects of science and regenerative medicine. So moving right ahead. Um, I think the goal, the goal for all of us is really to improve therapies for our patients through translational research and teamwork. At UC Davis, we collaborate very closely with our uh, School of Veterinary Medicine, uh, ranked number one in the nation. Just have to get in that little, that little comment. Um, <clears throat> we have a lot of regenerative medicine trials ongoing for pets and for horses and our other companion animals, and we even treat animals at the Sacramento Zoo with their own mesenchymal stem cells for different um, lameness and injuries that they get. So working very closely with these teams and learning a lot from large animal models. And we have veterinarians that um, train in our institute and are taking the regenerative medicine that we learn from the animals into uh, clinical trials in humans. So it's a very unique environment. We have a large number of disease teams at UC Davis. And what's unique about these disease teams is that we have um, basic translational and clinical faculty investigators working together. And what the unique and great thing is that we have this uh, shared translational laboratory where we're doing the final IND enabling studies, working toward the clinical trials. And each of these teams um, meets there or has a, a laboratory bay there where their trainees are working with us in the same environment. So it's, it's pretty cool to have the Huntington's team working next to the I team and next to the cardiac team. We share equipment and ideas, um, regulatory core, uh, wonderful personnel that help us. Um, the uh, amazing Geraldine Annette, who's here with us, who's our uh, clinical research director, helps foster all of these teams uh, moving forward toward clinical trials. So the green arrows are the teams that have cell therapy and regenerative medicine uh, clinical trials or um, same-day clinical procedures um, currently ongoing or recently completed uh, using uh, stem cells or a type of regenerative medicine. And the red ones are those where we are working with the FDA to finalize the clinical trial and get it um, into, the, into the patients. And those two that have the rainbow arrows, our favorite, are um, our favorite type of arrow, are those that have just recently gotten um, IND clearance from the FDA and we're waiting for our institutional review board at UC Davis to clear them. So lots going on and on a typical day, um, Geraldine and I will go in and we put on our, our uh, swallowing disorders team uh, hat first and then we take it off and put on our liver disease team hat and everybody just comes and meets in our conference rooms and um, a lot of the team members overlap because they're doing similar things like um, a team member might be doing the molecular analyses or the um, gene editing for one team and also another team. This is the pipeline moving toward uh, clinical trials and through the phase three trial to commercialization. And this uh, pipeline is borrowed um, from our friends at, at CIRM at the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. And I particularly like it because it shows um, going from the very basic research through translational research using animal modeling into the phase one clinical trial. <clears throat> which is of course a, a smaller number of people, usually uh, around uh, 20 to show safety initially, then into a phase two clinical trial. This is a controlled clinical trial, usually with a placebo arm or a standard of care arm. And then through phase three, which is a large multi-center clinical trial that must uh, demonstrate efficacy for the product to be approved and move into um, what are the approved therapies. And approved means that they can be um, prescribed or uh, uh, dictated by, by an MD that they must happen and then uh, they are reimbursed by insurance. And so we have um, teams working along the spectrum through the phase three trials, some industry sponsored, um, some investigator initiated, and then we have the uh, approved therapies also going on at UC Davis. This is our institute. So this um, 
amazing institute that we're so lucky to have was funded by a um, 20 million dollar uh, renovation grant a major facilities grant from california institute for regenerative medicine uh, that funded the part in blue so we have the stem cell discovery lab on this side there's uh, more a little more basic science going on over there we all work in this shared translational lab and this is where we're finalizing the the um, IND enabling uh, studies, and it can be uh, relatively small because most of the teams are working in the vivarium. This is a vivarium with, um, does the FDA toxicity testing, um, rule out teratoma, rule out tumor, um, xenografting, all uh, immune deficient mice and uh, humanized immune deficient mice, which means that we give the mice a human immune system shortly after birth. And you can test a wide range of human stem cells in these immune deficient mice. And that's a, a field I've been working in for the, the 30 years of my uh, career in regenerative medicine. These teams are all hoping to get their, um, their development candidate, their product, into manufacturing in our um, amazing good manufacturing practice facility that's run by my colleague for many years, um, Professor Gerhard Bauer. And that is uh, right next door to us. It has all of its own air handling, and that's how it can be sandwiched in between these, these labs. We have industry partners down at this end. So we have the PetNet um, imaging and uh, radio pharmaceutical uh, training program that is um, training the radio pharmacists of the future. A uh, proposed auditorium, still shell space. And then we have um, stem cell industry partner space down at the end where um, companies can actually come in and uh, lease space down there that's outside of the CERM funded area, lease space to come and work um, in our uh, very uh, vital and busy environment and um, work with us and partner with us and um, take advantage of the expertise that's in the building. This is a breakdown of the shared translational lab, just showing um, trainees in every team, and these numbers might not be accurate. Some of them actually have like eight trainees because most of them are uh, fellows in the clinic and they just come in for the weekly meetings. But these are the numbers that actually work there in the bays. And so we have our cores there, and these, um, these cores serve all of the academic um, teams at UC Davis, on our, we are on the Sacramento campus. Um, they serve the faculty on the Sacramento and the Davis campus across the causeway. Other academic um, investigators and also industry uh, investigators. And we run these cores as fee-for-service, so no um, intellectual property is exchanged. We just do manufacturing. And in between grants, that allows us to keep our core team of experts um, paid and keep them on the team because as we all know grants go up and down up and down and otherwise we would have to lay off people that we've worked with for 20 years when when the grant ends so the cores are um, incredibly important to us and we have people who have been doing this for a very long time um, 20 years or uh, 30 years for uh, Gerilyn and Gerhard and I and so we we do have a lot of ex expertise so this just shows where how the different um, teams are laid out and my uh, Office is uh, right down here, so I'm the first person that waves at you through the window when you first come in, and uh, it's just—it's a wonderful place. I, I love seeing the trainees coming in the morning. I love coming to work in the morning, and I just have to say it's really the best job in the world, and I'm so grateful to have it. We do a lot of training, and this is—I um, love giving this talk because uh, training is at the the center of my heart and uh, of what we do. So, this is a picture of our. Um, one of our most recent cohorts of the CERM-funded uh, high school training program. This is our 2014 student cohort. This is a training program where the students work with their high school teacher all year to create a website. They're then um, judged by our Teen Biotech Challenge at UC Davis, and we have a lot of, a lot of training opportunities throughout UC Davis. And the 10 winners get, get to come spend their summer with us instead of having fun um, before they go to college or go into their senior year. And they come and actually work at the bench with us. They create a poster and then they go to the, to the CERM uh, Poster Awards, which is an incredible event and um, is really uh, life-changing for these students. And we um, try to uh, offer preferentially to um, students from uh, disadvantaged backgrounds, if, if at all possible. Many of them are, <clears throat> sorry, the first in their family to go to college as I was. 
Uh, we have another amazing training uh, program with Sacramento State University, which is just a few blocks away from us. This is my alma mater. I started out at Sac State. So uh, I grew up in Northern California, a single mom. I was so lucky to go to Sac State, and it, I got an amazing uh, education there. I then went on to UC Davis and then on to uh, University of Southern California. So always, um, you know, just believe it can happen and somehow it can happen. But this, um, this training program is very near and dear to my heart. Um, this is also funded by CIRM, and the students in this get a professional uh, science master's degree. And we've trained so far 50 students in this. They've um, received their master's. They are, all, all of them are employed in science or have gone on to uh, medical or graduate school, except for one who chose to become a dancer. But that's, that's okay. Follow your tennis ball in life, right? Find that tennis ball like, like the retriever does. <laughs> Just focus on the tennis ball. So um, very, very proud of this. The students, um, <clears throat> sorry, take didactic coursework for um, a year, and then they come and work with us at the bench for um, eight months and uh, get on papers and things which really help their further career development. We have a unique uh, visitor program at UC Davis. Those, so this is really um, designed for a visiting international scholar training and research. It was really designed for um, scholars from companies, but we're also partnering with um, international and national uh, academic institutions and national companies for their um, students to come and train with us. <clears throat> Sorry, this is a sponsored um, training. The um, host institution pays for the student and their, um, their uh, research costs. It's, a, it's really a nominal amount and then um, they get to come and train in our center with us, and we're very proud of this, and um, please uh, ask me if you're interested in it. So we work with the full spectrum of uh, stem cells, all types of stem cells. We really focus a lot on the mesenchymal stem cells, which are the broad, flat stem cells from bone marrow that you've heard a lot about at this, um, at this conference, and also the induced pluripotent stem cells from individual patients. Um, where we can make the lines. We do have a collaboration with the uh, New York Cord Blood Bank to make um, homozygous lines that would match a lot of people. And uh, very excited about that project. The, um, the first type of cell uh, that I'll address is the uh, blood forming or hematopoietic stem cells, just because that's where uh, I started my career. And um, this was in uh, starting stem cell gene therapy trials in ADA deficiency with Don Cohn's lab in Los Angeles. And Don Cohn was an amazing mentor and taught me the, um, the essence of team science at a very early age. I started with Don in 1987. And we were working on doing um, hematopoietic stem cell, blood forming stem cell gene therapy on the bubble babies. And for that, we used um, their cord blood for the early trials, and Don has now gone to using uh, the bone marrow from the children uh, once they're a little bit older. We use a safe vector uh, to introduce the gene that's missing and then reinfuse the uh, blood forming stem cells into the kids. And Don has now gone on to um, have a functional cure for uh, 23 uh, kids with bubble baby disease who would otherwise have no immune system. And it has been uh, deemed a functional cure. This slide is from when uh, 18 were cured and now it's 23. So, so um, incredibly proud to have started that. And this is uh, my mentor, Don Cohn, had to show a picture of him. Super amazing guy and has trained uh, so many people. I was his first. and. Um, just, uh, it's been a, an amazing career, and he is still my mentor. He still helps me, even as old as I am. So for my, for my thesis work uh, in Don's lab, we were uh, developing these hematopoietic blood-forming stem cell therapies, but to get the stem cells to engraft in immune-deficient mice, I developed a technique to transduce these uh, mesenchymal stem cells. We call them uh, marrow-stromal cells back then. Um, transduce those to make growth factors that the uh, blood forming cells needed. And so um, that allowed the cells to engraft in the mice. So for my career, I stayed on the MSC side and Don continued to develop this uh, gene therapy for the bubble babies. So MSCs, um, I've been having a love affair with these cells for 30 years now, almost 30 years. 
And they can be genetically engineered to produce protein and other factories, factors for delivery to target cells and tissues in the body. And they do become little factories that are there temporarily for a month or two in the tissue, um, delivering and secreting the factors. And so delivery can be through secretion and then uptake with receptors or through direct transfer with tunneling nanotubules, exosomes, and microparticles. And thus, um, factors that are normally inside their cytoplasm can be transferred to uh, the target cells. So if we could start that video, if you don't mind. Um, this is showing the cells um, interacting in the culture dish. These are all uh, MSCs. You can see over here they formed a tunneling nanotubule. And if you look closely, there are mitochondria transferring from one cell into the next. And it's usually a one-way flow, and we don't really know what dictates that. We're, we're studying that. Right in this area, the cells are going to release a whole bunch of... Um, nanoparticles. It's in the upper right quadrant for those of you who are uh, following along. They are right uh, about here. And then the other cell comes and takes them up. And the other, the cell that took them up gets a bunch of new ATP from all those mitochondria it took and all those factors divides and goes on about its business. So there's a lot of transfer. These cells are great bioreactors and they um, transfer everything that they're making into the, uh, the damaged tissue. If we could start this one, please. These are uh, MSCs labeled in green, uh, sorry, MSCs labeled in red, and uh, myoblasts, the muscle-forming cells, labeled in green. And you can see the degree of cell-to-cell um, -cell interaction. They're leaving the little red particles around, and the myoblasts are uh, taking them and absorbing them. And um, this video uh, is not working very well on this platform, but it is uh, just published in uh, Human Gene Therapy Methods, and it's online. And I'm happy to send you the link if anyone's interested in uh, showing it to your students, because it's kind of fun. I could just watch it all day when it works smoothly. <laughs> So we have all of these teams and many of them working with MSCs because really that's my uh, background and expertise. And these cells are very safe in clinical trials and have been um, uh, a great platform for delivery. So we're working on two uh, genetically engineered MSC platforms, MSC uh, vascular endothelial growth factor to try to prevent uh, amputation in patients with critical limb ischemia and MSC uh, producing brain-derived neurotrophic factor for um, Huntington's disease. And Huntington's disease has really been a labor of love between our teams, the uh, medical doctors uh, that work on Huntington's disease in our clinic, and the patient advocates. So each um, therapy starts with a new idea. Really, so many new ideas start with philanthropy because when we write a grant, we write the grant, we have an idea, you put in the grant, six months later you might find out about the grant, and then months after that you might get a check and be able to start on that new idea that you had almost a year ago. So philanthropy allows us to start investigating, it allows any scientist to start investigating a, a promising idea right away. And then foundations and seed grants help um, leverage. You need great uh, figures and data to get uh, major award grants to develop the therapies. And then we also need uh, philanthropy for uh, sustainability at the universities. And sometimes we need philanthropy a little uh, later on, too, to get a little further. So therapy development for Huntington's, uh, we had amazing committed donors to Huntington's disease research funding a generation of seed data for development of um, actually several potential stem cell therapies. Uh, foundation gifts allowed more testing of the idea. Major funding was obtained. A clinical trial is in development. This was the celebration with the advocates when we got the uh, disease team uh, trial grant back in 2012. Stuck, sorry. Can we go to the next slide? There we go. So this is our team. Uh, we are working on mesenchymal uh, stem or stromal cells engineered to produce BDNF as a potential treatment for Huntington's disease. The lab team, um, the, uh, our amazing uh, fearless leader, Dr. Vicki Wheelock, and also uh, Terry Tumpkin, and there's uh, Geraldine, who's with us here today. That is our uh, HD team leadership, uh, Power in Pink. And, um, the Vicki and Terry, who run our Huntington's disease clinic, uh, follow 350 families with Huntington's disease and 17 children with juvenile Huntington's disease. So there's a huge need. This is a terrible neurodegenerative disease. It is always fatal. Half of the children born to an affected parent uh, will get it. 
So we've done a large number of studies. We've done proof of concept studies. We've had the pre-pre-IND meeting with the Food and Drug Administration, did the chemical manufacturing controls, identity potency. Cells are not changed by BDNF secretion. Looked at levels, genetic stability, did pivotal efficacy studies in immune suppressed HD mice. And this is just coming out in the, um, the uh, journal uh, Molecular Therapy that's very uh, prestigious in our field of gene therapy. We've done retention studies in immune suppressed transgenic mice, had the pre-IND meeting with the FDA on July 2015. We have the pivotal biosafety studies ongoing, funded again by philanthropy because we had reached the end of the two years of the CIRM funding that we had. And then our IND application is planned and the package is in preparation. So this is our um, timeline. We started out with the proof of concept data that was done in Dr. Gary Dunbar's lab. And by the way, um, Gary uh, was the mentor of, um, of Dustin, who won our, our young investigator award. No, was not. Oh, excuse me. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Sorry. So uh, you, you always hang out with him at the, at the neurotherapeutics. So I thought you remember the team. So, so Gary um, had started out the mouse um, MSC BDNF work. We then took it and moved it into um, studying MSC BDNF in the human cells. And so we've done a, a large amount of um, work funded by CIRM. There is a pre-cell observational clinical trial ongoing. 30 patients are being followed at every six months. They're getting spinal taps. They are giving selflessly toward this um, trial and the future of cell therapy for Huntington's disease. Um, after we had our pre-IND meeting, the um, FDA asked us for the biosafety studies, which we now have ongoing, the dose finding studies we now have ongoing, and three little pigs. So that is our, that is our sticking point. We need these three little pigs. We're using a novel catheter to get the cells into the brain. Had not been used yet for MSCs, and so we are, um, again, uh, depending on our, on our amazing Huntington's disease community to help us fund the, um, the injection of the cells into these three little pigs so we can apply for the IND and hopefully go into the clinical trial. We are actively um, talking to industry partners that might want to be involved in this because you could possibly get, uh, possibly get funding for a phase one clinical trial from CIRM, um, from other institutions, but from other uh, funding institutions, but to go forward into phase two, phase three clinical trials and take it into a commercial product, very expensive and you absolutely need industry. We have an amazing <clears throat> juvenile Huntington's disease gene editing team run by um, Kyle Fink. He's my uh, incredible postdoc here. <clears throat> he did train with Gary Dunbar, sorry. <laughs> this I know for a fact. <laughs> Gary uh, gave me his, his uh, firstborn son, not the firstborn, but uh, his um, amazing student to come and work on this project. And Kyle is now leading the uh, incredible group working on uh, gene editing for juvenile Huntington's disease. And this is a very cool uh, project using um, towels and talons, and um, we can uh, cut out some of the uh, some of the. Uh, CAG repeats that cause this, um, enhanced gene expression for modifiers or blocked gene expression. And so one of the things they're working on, this gene is, this um, mutant gene is, has uh, CAGs, too many CAGs, we need to cut them out and get down to a normal level that should not be, um, uh, cause the mutant protein that, that kills the neurons. And so that's a, that would be a normal level. This works very well in the dish. Uh, the team is now publishing it and we're moving it into the brain of the transgenic mice. You can also do mutant allele uh, silencing with a, with a crab domain um, and that should stop uh, gene expression. And so this team is working uh, very hard on this. They are completely funded by uh, philanthropy at this point and uh, NIH um, awards for training. So the best new ideas come from, the, come from the students always. We also have an exosome team run by um, Jonathan Anderson. He's a, another uh, incredible postdoc in my group and his students um, who work in our group. And this is a collaboration with Karolinska Institute and Dr. Uh, Letio's uh, students at the Karolinska. And working on the exosomes, the little particles that the MSCs release that are full of all of the goodies. And we're using those particles to deliver the gene editing uh, cargo to the neural stem cells. 
So from the lab to the patient is always our motto. We are always working toward that. We have an amazing good manufacturing practice facility. We do fee-for-service contracting um, and partnering uh, whatever, whatever industry or academic collaborators need. We're using the Terumo hollow fiber uh, bioreactor. This is the modern approach to growing a lot of cells instead of these huge um, cell factories or cell hotels, the multi-layers that are, uh, take a lot of space. We have the flyers if anybody's interested. There's a booth downstairs. And we also have the fee-for-service cores for uh, IND enabling studies that we're doing for a large number of um, corporate and academic partners. So that is what I have. Um, many people have said it takes a village. It takes a village of trainees. It takes a village of patient advocates working with the scientists and the MDs who largely want to help their patients and don't um, don't know how until they uh, team up with the, um, the whole team that can get it through the regulatory hurdles and do all of the IND enabling studies and test um, all of the different um, things that need to go into a stem cell clinical trial. So that is what I have, and thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. I'd like to call up Mr. Suzuki. Please uh, have a seat a minute, sir. Thank you for, thank you for coming. So uh, as I, if you uh, attended yesterday the uh, Japanese, wonderful Japanese symposium uh, and heard my remarks, I just want to underscore that uh, uh, certainly I am impressed and I think uh, the thought leaders in my own country, my ho home country of the United States, are hugely impressed with the advancements uh, in leadership provided by the nation of Japan, uh, not only through its wonderful academic uh, research, um, of course, Dr. Yamanaka at Kyoto University uh, received the Nobel Prize for IPS cells that have uh, revolutionized this uh, field, but also uh, leadership in innovation, re innovative regulation. You know, the thought of us uh, curing a mouse, of a mouse of diabetes and taking it 30 years to get into the human population is unacceptable. So uh, Japan, in coordination with academia and industry are, and government, are working together in a unique way. We learned yesterday that the Japanese Society of Regenerative Medicine has 5,000 plus members. You know, I don't know if it equals or surpasses the International Society for Stem Cell Research, but that's absolutely jaw-dropping. Well, another aspect um, of Japan and its leadership is its uh, coordination of industry uh, through something called FIRM that uh, might not be a household word here, but is very well known among industry leaders and certainly in Japan, which is the Forum for Innovation, Innovative Research Regenerative Medicine, Forum for Innovative Regenerative Medicine. And as an industry group, not only uh, do they, uh, members of industry in Japan, interact with each other, but they also interact with the world of industry. So we felt it was very important that FIRM have a platform at the World Stem Cell Summit to, um, to understand what their goals and objectives are and ways uh, that uh, their goals and objectives intersect with the global community. Uh, so we're very pleased today to have as our speaker, Mr. Kunihiko Suzuki, who is the vice chairman of the Forum for Innovative Regenerative Medicine. Also, he's a member of the board and vice chairman of one of the thriving companies in our space, uh, Medinet, uh, based in Japan. And I hope uh, as part of his presentation, he will inform us a little bit about Medinet as well. So let's all welcome Mr. Suzuki and thank him for traveling so far to come to the World Stem Cell Summit. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bernard Siegel, uh, for the nice uh, presentation, uh, no introduction for me. And uh, uh, today I will uh, make uh, speeches uh, as a uh, for the uh, plenary uh, note uh, as a note presenter. It is quite a privilege for me to do that. Thank you very much for the opportunities. And uh, after the very, very uh, scientific and uh, also the academic uh, talked, 
by uh, for the of the uh, UC Davis. I uh, will uh, concentrate on the much more industrial or commercialization side today. <laughs> How do we do, do it? Next slide. Oh, okay. The, I will start with the uh, um, discussion about the market in Japan. Uh, you may uh, you uh, saw in the past. Uh, this is a. Uh, research works a study of the uh, Ministry of Economy and Trade and Industry of Japan the, about the future market of the regenerative medicine. Uh, left hand side is in Japan and also the right hand side in global. And uh, within a, in a year of uh, 2050, it become a quite quite big amount. Even here in Japan, it will be a 20. 5 billion US dollar level, and in the world it might be a 330 billion US dollar level. Uh, this is a quite a aggressive figure, I believe, but uh, this is an opportunity in our space. And the second one, uh, this slide shows uh, the, about the supporting industry for the regenerative medicine. The, for the supporting industry, I mean the company who provides the uh, like uh, uh, devices or machines and uh, facility and also disposables and uh, other uh, reagents and also the services like uh, contract manufacturing services or contract research organization services. So uh, the figure itself is a uh, um, around one third of the original industry of regenerative medicine, but the uh, supporting industry also the big market uh, for the, uh, the our space, and we can ex expect uh, lots of lots of business uh, the players here in uh, the regenerative medicine industry. Uh, I will talking about the uh, farm itself. The, at this moment, uh, by the end of uh, November, the number of uh, members is uh, uh, more than 180. And we are uh, divided into the, uh, four categories, four sectors uh, for the members. And uh, regenerative medicine or cellular therapy providing company or a development company, and also the biotechnology and pharmaceutical in total, that sector, the member comes from that sector uh, with uh, 43 companies. And the other in, uh, sectors, like a machinery uh, device, and also the chemical materials sector, and also the other sectors like, such as uh, logistics, insurance company, or consulting people, each of them has a uh, 35, 44, uh, 59. As I told you, a supporting industry is, is, uh, comes from the more than comes from the supporting industry sectors. Comes from uh, the number is a more than 130, or 100, nearly 140 company in uh, joined firm at the moment. And uh, uh, the the top line uh, we show the firm, firm itself was established coming back to the June 9, uh, 2011 and we are now four year and a half, nearly four and a half years old. And uh, we start with only the 14, one four companies as an established member. But within, within the four years, it become uh, 10 times more or 12 times or something like that. The, uh, the uh, growth was so rapid. And uh, this is an organiz organization chart of the firm. The, we are quite uh, close to the arm of uh, Alliance for Regional Medicine in the United States and Europe. Uh, I will uh, let you know later on in detail. However, uh, this chart of, the, of this kind of activity of the uh, firm is uh, uh, close to the arm's activities. Uh, the, we have the in total, uh, uh, the act, actual uh, six uh, committees who has a special tasks. 
uh, from the top. Uh, one is the Business Strategy Committee and the uh, Public Relations Committee and the Supporting Industry Committee and the Sta Standardization Committee and the Regulatory Committee and the Medical Economics Committees. Uh, among them, and the Supporting Industry and the Regulatory Committee and the Medical Economics Committee has a, a, a working group. The, for example, Supporting Industry, uh, we have the uh, five working group, including a cell processing center of cell processing facility and automation of the uh, cell culturing and uh, re uh, reagent and the media working group and also the transportation uh, logistics group and also the disposable and the materials uh, working group. In the area of uh, uh, medical economics, the, we have the two uh, uh, working group. One is the insurance. Insurance means uh, uh, two types. Uh, one is uh, in the private uh, insurance uh, companies involved for the uh, working group to establish a private insurance for the regional medicine for patient and also the, uh, for the players like us. And also the reimbursement working group. It is the uh, most important uh, area we have to be concentrated on. Then uh, we move to the, the uh, list of the companies. Uh, this is uh, as of uh, May 2015. The, I show you the figure of the uh, 181 as of uh, end of uh, uh, November. But uh, point is, uh, I think uh, there are lots and lots of members at the moment. I cannot uh, tell you all of them, but uh, you can see the uh, many, many members uh, is here. And uh, this is another uh, list of the uh, members' companies. Uh, you can see the some companies are quite uh, uh, worldwide uh, players, like a Fujifilm or, or a Hitachi, a Kawasaki, or Panasonic, and also the Takeda and Asteras, and also the other uh, company like uh, 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 the Thermo and the Olympus and Nikon. Uh, these are the uh, major uh, members who are uh, take care of the activity, or each activity of the uh, firm. And uh, this is the uh, office, the picture of the office of the, of the firm. We have the uh, uh, office in the center of Tokyo. Uh, it's uh, quite close to the uh, Tokyo uh, stations. And uh, uh, the building used to be a uh, headquarter of Astiras but now it's become a, a part of the uh, uh, property uh, company of a Mitsui Group in Japan. And uh, this uh, building called uh, Nihonbashi, that is the name of the place, Nihonbashi uh, Life Science Building, Life Science Building. And the uh, top right is uh, uh, the list of the company or organization who are in the, in the building. And the uh, 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 bottom right is a, uh, uh, the pictures when the office was opened. And uh, for right is uh, myself, and uh, next, uh, next to me is uh, our chairman, uh, of, uh, the, uh, Dr. Yuzo Toda, uh, who comes from the Fujifilm. Okay. And uh, next, uh, I will uh, review the re uh, regulatory framework of the Japan, you may know uh, very, quite well, but uh, in order to uh, update your memories, I will explain the uh, regulatory framework again, and also the, I will explain the uh, commercialization or industrialization, which will relate to the uh, new regulatory framework in Japan. Uh, when we talking about the industrializations, the top of the, uh, we just uh, see the uh, red uh, arrows, uh, lines, are like it regulatory. Uh, before the new uh, regulatory framework, we uh, always uh, uh, feel uh, uh, frustrations or problems. 
about the gap between the research to the actual market. And uh, uh, we try to, uh, say, fill in the, such a kind of uh, gap with uh, our effort, but the uh, most difficult uh, area was the regulations. In Japan, the uh, uh, regulation was, uh, it's not so, uh, say, advanced, to be honest, in the area of pharmaceuticals. Uh, if we compare with the uh, uh, regulatory framework uh, in the uh, United States and Japan, we feel something uh, we need some area to be improved. And also in the area of uh, medical devices, uh, European market has a much, much better uh, regulatory framework. And then uh, after the uh, Nobel Prize for uh, Professor Yamanaka of Kyoto University, uh, Japanese government, uh, I think they found out the this is a good opportunity for, the, for Japan to improve the, with the, uh, with the uh, support by the news of the uh, Nobel Prize for uh, uh, Professor Yamanaka. We have to change the regulations. This is the right time to do that. They thought like that. And uh, some uh, government officials whom I am quite close, they have the uh, uh, formal or informal discussions how to do it. And uh, with uh, two, three years, uh, start after the, uh, the Nobel Prize, two, three years ago, uh, three years ago, uh, Japanese government uh, or government officials tried to make it to the, to the reality. And uh, the top line shows the previous framework and the bottom line shows a new uh, framework. This is an image of the, of the uh, regulatory framework. In the previous one, is that there are no category of the regenerative medicine. Uh, we have to uh, pick up from either pharmaceutical lines or medical device lines. Both of them are not fit to the nature or to the, to the nature or to the character of the regenerative medicine. This is a, uh, uh, the treatment or technology using the living cell or living tissues. This is completely different from the pharmaceuticals or machines. Then a new framework gives us uh, another opportunity. Uh, the, uh, give us a new, new uh, say, uh, f framework. The new categories uh, established the name of the regenerative medicine, uh, precisely the including in Japan, uh, in the area of uh, act on the uh, on pharmaceutical and the medical device. In that categories, uh, you can see that part, or that part. This is uh, including uh, gene therapies. Purely gene therapy is included there, not only the regenerative medicine. And uh, another uh, framework comes to the, uh, under the name of uh, uh, the Act on the Safety of uh, Regenerative Medicine. This is uh, uh, regulations for the medical treatment itself at the place of the clinic, clinic, uh, clinical place, and also the uh, clinical uh, studies at the university hospital or research hospital there. And uh, this is a new, uh, unique uh, categories, uh, new uh, regulations for the uh, treatment. I will let you know in detail later on. And this is a, uh, the description about the act on the pharmaceuticals and the medical device. And this is the most uh, uh, famous the slide you have uh, already uh, seen in the, uh, quite uh, many times. Uh, point is uh, uh, always uh, we mentioned uh, the, uh, oh, sorry about that. Uh, could you return the slide, sorry about that? Ah, yes, okay. And uh, conditional and time-limited approval. In total, we call it uh, expedited approval systems. 
and uh, uh, conditional and term limited authorization is a very very uh, unique systems and uh, the if we confirm uh, if we find out they are likely to predict efficacy and the confirming a safety that means uh, in general uh, it is uh, just after the phase one or phase two studies of uh, clinical trials, then uh, we may uh, get the uh, authorization with a condition of, uh, to make uh, additional, say, uh, post-marketing surveillance. And uh, the data should be uh, used in future, uh, after the uh, five, seven years, uh, to make uh, another, uh, say, assessment or check by the uh, authorities, which is called the PMDA in Japan. And uh, another uh, act is uh, the Act on the Safety of uh, Regenerative Medicine, and which is uh, uh, typical uh, the uh, regulations control the uh, uh, clinical uh, spaces. And uh, medical doctors uh, in the past controlled only by the uh, medical doctors, uh, medical practitioners law or medical corporation law. This is a very general uh, law for only for the medical doctor and the medical corporations. And uh, under the, such a kind of uh, uh, regulations, uh, the doctor has a very, very strong uh, discretion power to choose the type of the therapies for the patient. If they take a risk, uh, the, they can do anything. Uh, someone uh, tell me, uh, even if I say you just inject with uh, only the water, that's okay. <laughs> but it's not a good thing for the patient or for the society. And uh, in Japan, uh, two, uh, three years ago or four years ago, at that time, there was uh, some uh, uh, say small, not all so big, but the small scandals at the place of the clinics. The, from the other countries, the, uh, the, the stem cell was uh, processed in the other countries. The, the, the product uh, imported to Japan and uh, in the clinics, that such a kind of a pro product was injected to the patient. Then after the patient comes to that country, then he died. And the Japanese uh, uh, regulation uh, sub the, and unfortunately support such a kind of, uh, say, uh, the uh, activities. So the uh, regulator was so concerned about this, such a kind of, uh, say, accident or, or scandals. And that is another uh, incentives for the government to change the rule. And uh, uh, in the, uh, compared with in the past, uh, Japanese uh, medical doctors are uh, much more tightly controlled by the uh, authorities, Ministry of Health. And uh, the one thing is uh, they have to issue the, uh, they have to submit, submit the plan for the, uh, for the providing a regenerative medicine to the patient. And that kind of uh, uh, some, uh, application will be divided into three categories. One is a very high risk, and the second is a middle risk, and the third is a lower risk. And in the case of uh, uh, high risk uh, the technologies using uh, ES or IPS, uh, that kind of area, or gene modeling sometimes, uh, that kind of area is uh, highly controlled by the, by the uh, committees, which is, uh, is, uh, uh, have the permission from the uh, Ministry of Health. And with a very lower risk type of uh, treatment technologies, this is a much more easy to get the approval at the committees, which is also the getting a, uh, authorization from the Ministry of Health. But uh, anyhow, that kind of uh, uh, medical uh, pra practitions or medi uh, clinical uh, treatment uh, is now is, uh, very, very highly controlled. And also they have to, uh, uh, medical doctors or clinics or hospitals have to uh, make a reporting 
periodically to the ministry. If there is a, some, uh, say, uh, severe uh, adverse effect happens, uh, they have to make a, uh, reporting as soon as possible. And that, that is a one aspect of the, uh, the Act on the Safety for Regenerative Medicine. And uh, the other is uh, I show on the, on the second lines uh, to in enable outsourcing of cell processing. And uh, in the past, uh, the only the uh, clinics or hospital can uh, make a, uh, cell processing uh, for, the, for the treatment. The private corporate cannot do that directly. But uh, with these uh, regulations, uh, private company like us, like Medinet, we can uh, provide directly to the uh, directly the services to the to the uh, hospital and the clinics. And uh, this is a, a combination of the of the uh, cell, uh, cell processing activities under the. Uh, and the act of the uh, the, uh, the safety, uh, the act on the, the safety for of the regenerative medicine, and also the uh, the act on the uh, pharmaceutical and the medical devices. You can see the, uh, the you can see the, the name of the act is uh, this is the old act name of the act, the old uh, say uh, name of the law. This is the uh, old uh, old uh, regulatory framework. It will be changed. Into the, the the act on the pharmaceutical and the medical devices, and the left hand side uh, changes into the act on the safety of uh, regenerative medicine. But uh, anyway, the uh, cell cultivation should be done by the by the uh, uh, corporate, uh, and also the, that kind of corporate uh, contract manufacturer can uh, uh, give the services to the, uh, to the uh, corporate or pharmaceutical company who like to uh, make a development of the uh, products. But uh, left hand side, the, at the clinical place, at the clinics or hospitals, the medical doctor can uh, provide uh, treatment to the patient. And uh, this slide shows the, uh, the some uh, uh, Gap uh, from the uh, in the past, yeah. Of course, uh, the development of the product or technology, uh, we have a uh, lots of lots of aspect we have to consider. The searching uh, technologies and the establishing a business strategy, and uh, co uh, compliant with the regulatory uh, framework, and also the um, uh, making a manufacturing and also the uh, marketing activities. We have a uh, lots of those things to be considered, uh, to be solved. And uh, in the past, left hand side, I show the uh, uh, wording of academic push. They're from the research uh, the, in the past, especially in Japan, the academic uh, push has happened to uh, make uh, a new technology to be a product. But uh, uh, at that time, uh, uh, the uh, adequate regulatory framework uh, di uh, did not exist. But now we have the, a very, very nice uh, regulatory framework, and the industrial pool can be uh, achieved. Uh, this slide shows us such a kind of concept. And uh, this is uh, uh, for the development of the circulation of the spiral. The uh, new science uh, cannot directly uh, say uh, uh, link to the patient. We have to move the, this kind of si uh, spirals. We have to establish a POC, and we have to uh, say making uh, uh, the manufacturing under the GCTP, uh, Japanese version of the GMP, and then uh, we have to get uh, uh, the approval from the authorities. And uh, that kind of things uh, can be accelerated with a new uh, regulatory framework. And uh, this is uh, another uh, the activity of a firm. A firm established uh, the, the new groups, group called the uh, uh, ARMIT, uh, Regional Medicine Industrialization Task Force. 
the 34 partners are involved to make it. This is a, like an a entrance uh, for the uh, foreign companies to Japan who like to uh, make uh, some project there in Japan. Uh, if you have uh, no specific uh, contact in Japan, you may come to Armit to discuss how to do it. And uh, sometimes uh, it does work, sometimes not. It depends on the, uh, the technology or uh, possibility of the market, uh, commercialization of the technology of, or <laughs> uh, treatment. And we are quite happy to, uh, say, uh, to discuss the opportunity uh, for you. And also the uh, firm, uh, the activities uh, in the global networking, is that we started, uh, say, alliance uh, in this year, March uh, this year, with ARM, Alliance for Regenerative Medicine. And after that, uh, we established a relationship with uh, Sweden in the October. And also uh, we expect the another uh, other uh, alliance with uh, Australia, and also Canada, and the expecting UK. And next year, uh, we will uh, make uh, the other, another uh, tie-up with uh, Asian countries. We try to do so uh, in order to accelerate or in order to uh, spread the new technology in the area of regenerative medicine or therapy for the patient in the world who uh, suffer from the, the disease or, or something like that. Injury, yes. And uh, this, is, this slide shows uh, just an image of the expectation for future in Japan. In Japan, uh, you can see the uh, line of the regenerative medicine. This is uh, figures of the uh, strategic pharmaceutical consultation. Uh, how, how many uh, company or product has been consulted with a PMDA. The, in total, uh, last two and a half years, uh, between the, uh, uh, July uh, 2011 to the December 2014, at that time, the total consultation number is uh, 248. Among them, a regenerative medicine-related figure is uh, 65. But if you see the company consultation, the number 30 is a half of the total uh, consultation. This is very unique. Uh, it, uh, it is very, very surprising figures for us. But the uh, thing is, uh, anyway, uh, this kind of uh, consultation, uh, 65, uh, from uh, 65, one third comes from the outside of Japan. That means uh, uh, the players uh, outside of Japan has already started the discussion with the Japanese government. We expect, uh, say, uh, we, are, we welcome uh, that kind of uh, approaches from outside Japan. And uh, this is a uh, product line or development in Japan. The top two has already awarded uh, the uh, market authorization before the new regulatory framework. Two companies, uh, two, uh, two products, uh, related to the uh, to the uh, uh, the uh, autograft, and also the another one is uh, uh, the uh, cartridge, and uh, both of them are pro uh, developed by the JTEC. That company is a subsidiary of uh, Fujifilm, and the other two uh, products are recently approved. One is uh, uh, the uh, MSC. Uh, product for the acute GVHD. Another, another one is a myoblast uh, seat uh, for the ischemic heart failure. And uh, the, the MSC is uh, uh, developed by the JCR farm and licensed from the uh, Osiris, uh, now uh, say mesoblast. And also the another one is uh, Terumo, uh, uh, took the, uh, uh, the responsibility for the development. The, the technology comes from the Osaka University. And the other six, much more, in, uh, in fact. But uh, we pick up the six uh, major uh, activities. And uh, some of them are uh, conducted by the uh, private sector. And uh, some of them are conducted by the academia. 
And then the next is the product. Uh, they are explaining the detail of the product, but uh, I have a limited time. We have a limited time. I just uh, showed you the slides. And the first one is a uh, JCR farm, and uh, then a product called the Temcel HS Inject. The f the, this is the first allergenic regenerative medicine in Japan. And uh, this is a, a similar, uh, same uh, say, technology uh, which, was, uh, which were approved in uh, uh, New Zealand and uh, Canada, I cannot remember in detail, but uh, for the children of GBHD. But uh, in this product is uh, also for the adult. And the next one is the heart seat. Uh, this is a terumo made uh, the heart seat. This is for the, uh, the surgery. This is like a, uh, the seat put on the, on the heart. And uh, this slide I have to uh, report uh, gray out figures in the right bottom is, uh, is uh, just uh, comes from the article of the Nikkei Bio. The, most of the, uh, the audience here are very, very uh, interested in the, the, how is the reimbursement of the new product after the uh, new, uh, approved by the new regulatory framework. And the Temcel and the Hatsit has a similar level of the reimbursement for the standard, standard uh, treatment uh, in total. Uh, this is a report, report from the Nikkei Bio. Uh, I'm not sure this, this figure is correct or not, but uh, the uh, uh, acute uh, GVHD for uh, uh, children, uh, adults, it costs uh, 14 million Japanese yen. It's like uh, uh, 10, uh, 100, or 120,000 uh, US dollar level. This is good or not, but uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not an expert of that area. But the uh, uh, thing is that the figure is a substantial amount, we believe. So the uh, Japanese government uh, reimbursement level uh, is, a, is not so bad, but we expect much higher as a, as a business uh, people, but uh, for the uh, for the uh, Japanese uh, budget for the medical uh, med med medical area uh, is limited, uh, same with uh, other countries. So therefore, a figure should be uh, lower, but uh, uh, this is a uh, uh, balanced figures, I believe. And uh, the firm's activity is uh, the National Strategic Special Zone. Uh, this is uh, uh, the the local uh, government gives the uh, opportunity to provide uh, this kind of project, Life Innovation Center. And the Life Innovation Center uh, has uh, uh, the four uh, type, uh, various type of the functions, including uh, say cultivation processing area or clinics or laboratory or support the venture uh, companies. And this part is the last of the, uh, my presentation. Uh, just in case uh, the, the uh, organization or doctors who like to, uh, say, utilize the Japanese uh, uh, unique re uh, regulatory framework, uh, for those kind of people, uh, you need uh, manufacturing functions. They are in Japan. Therefore, I will explain to you. The, uh, if you try to make a product development, there, there are three typical um, contract manufacturer. One is a Medinet, and the other is a JTEC, and the Takara Bio. And uh, the, this is a Medinet where, which I come from. The, uh, there is a, a good uh, say, uh, facility, new facility we have close to the Tokyo Haneda. International Airport, and uh, there are uh, nice functions. The keyword, just one word I can tell you, one-stop solution provider for regenerative medicine and uh, cellular therapy. Medinet uh, tried to do. <laughs> and uh, JTEC, 
uh, they have the uh, two uh, products. Uh, they are, their office, their uh, facility of the manufacturing the GMP compliant or GCTP compliant. Another one is uh, Takara Bio. Uh, they have the uh, experiences for the gene and cell processing. Gene, uh, they have the technology for the gene modifying modifications. That's all. <laughs> uh, the, uh, sorry, that takes a little bit more time, but uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, listening. If you feel it is a good opportunity for you to come to Japan, you are welcome. Thank you.